It's Monday, November 2. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Carol Francis. The Meteorological Service of Jamaica has extended a flash flood watch for low-lying and flood-prone areas of all parishes. It will remain in place until 5 tomorrow afternoon. The Met Service said Tropical Storm Eta is moving westward across the Central Caribbean at 24 kilometers per hour. On the forecast track, it is expected to continue passing south of Jamaica and should reach Nicaragua by Tuesday morning. Although the scent of Eta is expected to remain southwest of Jamaica, its extreme outer bands will continue to generate unstable weather conditions across the island for the next few days. Current projections are for cloudy conditions across the island, with periods of showers and thunderstorms, which could be heavy at times, especially across northeastern and southern parishes. Meanwhile, Minister of Local Government and Rural Development Desmond McKenzie is urging all Jamaicans to take the necessary precautions to ensure they remain safe. All 14 municipalities across the country is on high alert. Shelters will be made available if it becomes necessary. We have post position, relief supplies, heavy duty equipment, and the first respondents are on standby if they are so required. This is not a period that we should ignore the warnings that are issued by the Weather Bureau. I can only again urge and ask my fellow Jamaicans to listen to the warning and take the necessary precautions. Starting today, Leslie Harrow takes up the mantle of Director General of the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, ODPEM. Mr. Leslie Harrow who is bringing some 25 years of service and experience in the field of administration and governance to the organization. The government recognizes the importance of the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management and therefore is putting in place the necessary mechanisms to ensure that the organization continues to perform. 74 positive COVID-19 cases have been identified at the Faith Center, which has been offering care to Jamaicans in need since the 1980s. Six of those who tested positive are staff members of the facility, which is operated by missionaries of the poor in downtown Kingston. A total of 125 people at the Faith Center were tested. Five results are pending. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has engaged missionaries of the poor to put a range of measures in place to slow the transmission of the virus at the facility. The measures include adhering to the previous recommendation of no one in and no one out, restriction of movement between residences and the ministries, strict adherence to the no visitor policy, adequate supply of personal protective equipment, and the wearing of masks by staff and residents at all times. Meanwhile, one elderly resident at the St. Anne Infirmary has died as a result of COVID-19. This resident is from the St. Anne Infirmary and has been ailing some time in the hospital for over two months. This is the third residence in our infirmaries and golden age home that has passed in the last week or so. I want to use this opportunity on behalf of the government to express our condolences to those who have passed, but also to use this platform 
to urge those who work with our vulnerable in our infirmaries to do so with the best of care. There are over 1,700 Jamaicans who reside in our infirmaries and Golden Age home who rely on the state for service. The government is cognizant of the concerns raising some quarters. But I want to assure you this morning that we have been working to ensure that we safeguard the interests of those persons. Though the island is still in a wave of COVID cases, the number of positives have been trending downward. Here is a look at the latest figures from the Health and Wellness Ministry. Jamaica's COVID-19 death toll now stands at 210. This brings the total positives to 9,257, of which 4,289 are active cases. 20 persons were deemed to have recovered from the virus, bringing that tally to 4,637. 14 patients are moderately ill and 6 are critical at this time. A total of 93 infected persons are currently in hospital. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Since the first COVID-19 case was reported in the island on March 10, testing has been mostly handled by the National Influenza Center located at the Department of Microbiology at the University Hospital of the West Indies, as well as the Public Health Lab. Well, not anymore. The Health and Wellness Ministry has approved two private labs to administer the PCR COVID-19 test. And that is the approval, finally, and I say finally, and I exhale <laughs> when I say finally, um, of two private labs that are now able, with the sanctioning, the approval, and indeed the recommendation of the Ministry of Health to offer COVID-19 related tests. This has been long in the making, a lot of dialogue, but I'm happy to say that we are now at a point where the validation studies have been done, the standards have been established and verified. And the, the, the first one, Carigen and Microlabs, Carigen working with Microlabs, Microlabs having the distribution network across the country, Carigen being an entity based at the University Hospital of the West Indies, combined private sector entities are now able for a cost or for a fee to offer the PCR test for COVID with the sanctioning of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Um, and that was achieved this week based on a long period of discussions testing and retesting, validation, and all of the other necessary steps to ensure that the public is protected and they get what they pay for. You can go to a microlabs, and they're all over the country. You can get swabbed, samples collected, sent into Carigen, and Carigen will do the tests, turn it around, and send back the results. The requirement is that this setup in the private space will require a reporting mechanism because from a public health standpoint, we need to know how many people are positive in the country, how many tests are done, how many are negative. That's critical for public health planning and for decision making at the highest possible level, including the level of cabinet and the government. But it is a major um, addition to the testing arrangements in the country, no longer are persons required to only depend for the credibility of the process on the government entities, which would have been the Public Health Lab and UWI, but they can now, through microlabs or directly to Carigen, do their testing for a fee. The month of November is observed as Local Government and Community Month. Effective local government is inclusive 
and can motivate united action in communities. This is particularly important at a time when the country is faced with the numerous challenges the COVID-19 pandemic has presented. These challenges are particularly prevalent in the areas of family life, community development, and youth empowerment. Minister of National Security, Dr. Oris Chang, underscored the importance of local government. We're in the middle of a pandemic in which the Ministry of Local Government plays a very critical role. He's not seen as often in the public space as the Minister of Health, but in fact the entire management and operation of disaster risk management act comes on the Ministry of Local Government. And uh, we are now at the height of the hurricane season in the Northern Caribbean, and we're going through the October rains, and again, the Ministry of Local Government is critical in managing and preparing us for any kind of extreme weather event at this point in time. Activities under the month-long celebration will be observed under the theme Building Resilience Through Continuous Investment in Local Government. Today is a day of celebration for life. Today we use this opportunity to examine how we operate as a country. Since COVID-19, we have learned many lessons. And I want to highlight the level of indiscipline in the society. There is a ban on parties. Nightclubs are banned from operating. But yet, the police, within the last 48 hours, have arrested and charged more than 100 persons who were found participating in various nightclubs across the country. Gunmen have claimed the lives of one man. 11 persons are nursing gunshot wounds at an illegal party in St. Catherine. My fellow Jamaicans, the government can only do so much and no more. The only cure for this coronavirus is the honesty and the responsibility of the Jamaican people. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. COVID-19 has disrupted the activities of cultural heritage sites and museums across Jamaica. In-person exhibitions and events have either been postponed or cancelled due to the need for social distancing. To ensure the public has access to our cultural treasures, the Institute of Jamaica, IOJ, held its annual Heritage Fest virtually. More from Marlon Samuels. The Institute of Jamaica, IOJ, recently held its first virtual staging of its annual Heritage Fest. It was under the theme, Treasures of the Institute of Jamaica, Every Object Tells a Story. The objectives of this year's Heritage Fest, themed Treasures of the Institute of Jamaica, was geared towards reintroducing the Institute of Jamaica as your Institute of Jamaica, where we collect, preserve, research, and develop cultural programs on your behalf. Highlight the various divisions and departments that make up what we call the Institute of Jamaica. Improve public awareness of the diversity of the Jamaican items in our collection. Inform the public about some of the remarkable artifacts in the collection as each object tell a story. To ensure that Jamaica is able to tell its own story, a strategy of the government is working to retrieve artifacts removed from the island. These activities underscore the importance of preserving the many expressions of our heritage for generations to come. As minister, I'm determined to ensure the repatriation of cultural objects taken from Jamaica, which constitute a rich cultural heritage. Indeed, 
Their return will help to fill the gaps in our history, which are critical to the process of understanding ourselves and fostering greater cultural awareness. In 1981, the British High Commission in Jamaica identified approximately 137 objects from Jamaica that were housed at the British Museum. Among those are two Taino objects, the Bonayel and the Birdman, taken from Carpenter's Mountain, now part of southern Manchester in 1792. Through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, we have initiated the process of engaging our British partners to bring these artifacts back home. At least three artifacts were each taken from various departments of the IOJ, including the National Gallery of Jamaica, the Jamaica Music Museum, and at Liberty Hall, the legacy of Marcus Garvey. The Amy Jakes Garvey Holy Bible is also a part of Liberty Hall's collection. This was given to us on January 5, 2017 by her son, Dr. Julius Garvey. Throughout the Bible, there are several highlighted passages, and on the title page, we'll find Amy Jakes Garvey's address, which reads, Amy Jakes Garvey, 12 Mona Road, Kingston 6, Jamaica, West Indies. The Marcus Garvey walking stick. A walking stick belonging to Marcus Garvey forms a part of the Marcus Messiah Garvey Multimedia Museum's collection. The two and a half foot, two pound walking stick has a sterling silver looped handle with the inscription that reads, Marcus Garvey, August 1922. The story behind this walking stick is that in 1919, there was an assassination attempt on Marcus Garvey's life. While he was at his UNIA office in Harlem, New York, he was shot twice in his right leg and once on the right side of his scalp. In pictures of Garvey after 1919, he is seen with a walking stick in his right hand. This leads us to believe that he was supporting his right leg where he was shot two times. The IOJ was established in 1879 by the then Governor General of Jamaica, Sir Anthony Musgrave. It is responsible to store and preserve the country's cultural heritage. For the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. Reggae legend Frederick Toots Hibbert will be laid to rest at the National Heroes Park in Kingston on Sunday, November 15. He will be interred next to reggae icon Dennis Brown in the last burial spot left in the area reserved in the park for the burial of cultural icons. Members of the public will be afforded an opportunity to pay their last respects at two public viewings of his remains, which will be conducted under strict COVID-19 protocols. The first viewing will be on Wednesday, November 11, at the Anglican Church Hall, Maypen Clarendon, followed by a second viewing on Friday, November 13, at the National Arena in Kingston. The viewings will run from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. The funeral coach bearing the remains of the cultural icon will also drive through the community of Treadlight District where he was born. A 90-minute tribute concert dubbed Toots, Farewell to Cultural Icon, featuring several of Jamaica's leading artists paying their respects by performing their favorite Toots songs and others giving testimonials, will air right here on PBCJ on Sunday, November 15, beginning at 5 in the afternoon. Several small farmers in St. Thomas want help in marketing their produce. The group, made up of former sugarcane workers, are engaged in cultivating cash crops. I farm for a living. Um, I plant one and, one and a half acres of pumpkin and everything, everything rotten. We would like the legacy that that started for us on this little plot and for the farmers on, on this whole eastern side of St. Thomas to continue. And we would like some assistance. We would like to, the, the eyes to be open for the farmers of this community and this parish. As you look behind me, there's the market that we get rotten fruit, those stay in the field and spoil. 
There are plans to establish an agroeconomic zone in St. Thomas to facilitate grading, packaging and processing of the small farmers' produce. Our farmer minister come here and him tell us to plan, to, just to go and produce. No, we go and produce and there is no market. So we are saying now to our new MP, he said to us that he is about to build a processing plant for us. So we are saying to our new MP now, come on and take up that role for us, that we can be able to be a better farmers. Time now for the business report with Gabriel Thompson. In Friday's trading session, the JSE combined index advanced by 2,730 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 77 stocks, of which 36 advanced, 26 declined, and 15 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 10 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica, Access Financial Services, and Caribbean Cream Limited. Stocks declined for AMG Packaging and Paper Company, Barita Investments, and Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited. Trading firm were 1834 Investments Limited, Berger Paints Jamaica, and Blue Par Group. The Limners and Bards Limited was the volume leader with 4.1 million units, followed by Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with 2.8 million units and Jamaican Tees Limited with 1.4 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The US dollar on Friday, October 30 ended trading at $145.19. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $110.93. The pound sterling traded for $191.07. And the euro ended trading at $174.48. Oil prices fell on Monday on worries that widening coronavirus lockdowns in Europe could weaken fuel demand and amid concerns about turbulence around this week's U.S. presidential election. Brent crude futures slid 97 cents to $36.97 a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures fell $1.04 cents to $34.75 a barrel. And that's it for the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. We go to news from the region. As Britain and other European countries enforce lockdown measures to crack down on spiraling COVID-19 cases, the Barbados government is stepping up its response. Prime Minister Mia Motley has announced a change to the island's travel protocols in a bid to ensure cases remain low. The government of Barbados has as its first responsibility to protect the lives and the livelihoods of its people. Because of that, and because of the fact that we have seen community spread in some of our neighboring territories, we are going to require from now on, and the Ministry of Health will announce the date from which it will start, that all persons coming into Barbados, regardless of whether it is from the high-risk countries of the U.S. and the U.K. and Canada now, or whether it is medium or low risk, as long as this second wave is about and knocking down people in the world, in the Western Hemisphere with whom we have airline contact, we will require all persons to have a PCR test before entering Barbados or to get one at the airport upon entry. And secondly, that then they will be subject to the second test within four to five days after that first test. In sports, we put the spotlight on cricket. West Indies head coach Phil Simmons says adapting to New Zealand conditions is crucial to winning the upcoming series against their hosts. The Caribbean side arrived in Christchurch on Friday and are currently in 14-day isolation, but will be allowed to begin daily training sessions at their sports-managed isolation facility after the third day of isolation. The Windies will clash with the Black Caps in a two-test series, as well as three 2020 internationals. 
Coach Simmons says key to any success would be how quickly players handle their acclimatization process. The tour is being played amidst the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and is the second one for West Indies this year, following last July's three-test series in England, which they lost to one. All members of the touring party tested negative for COVID-19 prior to their departure from the Caribbean last Tuesday and also tested negative upon arrival in New Zealand. The series runs from November 27th to December 15th. And that's our package. Join us again tomorrow for more news and sports right here on PBCJ, the People's Station.